Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Good morning, everyone on Zoom. Good morning, everyone at the, in the balcony. It's great to see you. I love all your excitement, your whoop whoops and stuff. It's uh, very good. It's great to see you. My name's Matt. My privilege to speak to you this morning. Let me pray as we begin. Lord, let's just take a moment of stillness. Still ourselves. Remember, he's here. Remember, we're here to hear his voice. We're here to, here to speak to us, to help us, teach us. Teach us this morning, Lord Jesus, by the Spirit. Teach us from your word. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for your Bible. Thank you. Would you, te- would you speak to us? We need your help. We want to change. Amen. So we're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians. If you've got a Bible, please to, do turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Last week, we looked at the wonderful uh, subject from the beginning of 1 Corinthians about head coverings, non-head coverings, and really, in essence, we were talking about how, as husbands and wives and men and women, we are to present ourselves and how we're to act in public worship and how we're supposed to respect those differences amongst us. It's quite a complicated subject. You can listen to the talk that Helen so wonderfully... Didn't she do a good job last week? Yeah? So, so, thank you so much, Helen, for helping me out, giving me courage to speak on such a difficult subject. And um, so, thank you. And and, um, today, it's more about the same. Public worship. The Corinthians were in a mess. the the, the church in a place called Corinth, they were in a mess. The way they were worshipping together like this was having to be corrected. And the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to to correct them. And um, we're going to be looking at what's called the Lord's Supper today, or communion, or Eucharist, different names for taking bread and wine. Bread and wine, the elements that we're going to be talking about this morning of what's called communion or the Lord's Supper or Eucharist. Different names for the same thing. You may have had some background in it. You may have some church background. You may not have some church background. So there'll be differences amongst us as to what we understand. And I'm going to be talking about what we understand from what Paul is saying this morning what the Lord's Supper is about. And then later on this morning, we're going to be taking communion in these weird little pot things that uh, are on your table. And, they, and therefore, for, for, during lockdown, we, we, we will go back to proper, as it, a proper loaf and proper um, wine, as it were, uh, at some point. But this is just for lockdown purposes. So, let me begin. Relationships are tested, aren't they? Amen? Phil laughs. It's, a, it's so obvious. Relationships are challenged all the time. And the church is meant to reflect something to, to those outside of the church. You notice it says they're our community. There's meant to, part of our vision. There's meant to be something about us, church, that reflects love that makes people around us think, oh, there's something special about that, that community. And I hope if you're a guest here this morning, you, you, you may have met some of the folk in this church, and you, I hope you feel loved by people. I hope you feel welcomed by people. But relationships, even in the church, and in some ways, especially in the church. And the reason why I say especially in the church is because we probably get together more often than other people. We're probably closer to each other than others. We encourage, as we talk to those new members, devotion to fellowship. That means we are together a lot. That means we have more opportunity to annoy each other than maybe the stranger that walks down the street. And they they had that saying about a prophet is without honor in his own town. 
And that, what that means basically is with the closer you get to people, the more you realize that they're human and you can disrespect them. And you can start to even dislike them, can I say it? We can find it hard to like each other. I, lo I love you. I love you, brother, but I want to hit you. I love you, brother. I don't really feel like that. I love you. I love you. I love you. But I don't feel, I feel challenged. And if you're anything like me, you will on occasion feel challenged in your friendships and relationships in the church. And this meal that we're looking at today is a gift to us to restore relationships with God and restore our relationships with each other. If a church takes bread and wine as it's meant to, what it signifies, what it's about, not just religiously, then the relationships will endure. We will persevere. We will work on it. We will, we will keep working on those difficulties. And we're going to learn about that today. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11. I hope you've done that. It begins in verse 17. Do try and have the Bible in front of you, and uh, we'll go through it today. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. So my words, that my preach this morning is, this morning, Community Church Putney, I have no praise for you. Can you imagine that? No praise. I, I, I just want to challenge you. It, it's such a, I love the way this is so counter-cultural, counter right? Let me ask you a question. You know, will, will we go to a church that actually talks about the Apostles' Doctrine? Or do we just want to go to a church that tells us we're all okay, you're okay, everything's all right. Whoever you, whoever you are, you're great. Go into the week and be great. You can do great. You are great. You're wonderful, aren't you great? There is a time loving challenge is important. And this is what he says, I have no praise for you. Your meetings do more harm than good. What on earth were they doing? Were they juggling snakes? Is it, is it wine or is it poison? Ha ha, according to your faith. What were they doing? Well, we know what they're doing. It's about bre breaking bread, communion. The way they were doing it and the way they were conducting themselves in church was, was not good. In the first place, verse 18, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. Dividing, we've, as we've gone through this, this book, we've seen there are differences uh, about allegiance to different leaders and divisions and so on. And, and there can be divisions, can't there, over many things. The big division, often in this time, was between Jews and Gentiles, a racial, religious background. These are the kind of tensions there can be nowadays. Of course they can. There can be class tensions there can be all kinds of tensions and divisions. You can be more allied to this leader, more allied to that leader. I like this person, I don't like that person, and so on. But as a church, we, ha we all have those inclinations to divide. We all have to work on them and repent and listen to the Holy Spirit and work on unity and love. Amen. So... There are divisions, and it goes in verse 19. No doubt there have to be differences among you. To, and I'm not going to be going through every phrase. You'll have questions about every phrase. Again, look at a study Bible. Think about it in your own time. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead in your own private suppers. As a result, one remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly 
not. Now, let's remember the context here. It's probably that the church in Corinth was meeting in homes. There wouldn't have been church buildings like this. We are privileged to have such a building like this where we can meet. We're privileged to have it. And again, I want to add my thanks to Jim's thanks for your generosity in paying for this building. And we can take it for granted. This is a blessing. Let's remember, in southwest London, we've got a space like this. It's amazing. We should be blessed. And I thank you for giving to this. Because it can be a bit boring, can't it? And, and you know, can I, giving, giving again to some, you know, I hope you don't find it boring. I hope you feel it's a privilege to, ha- to have such a space as this. And it's not also, I don't, don't also forget as well, we're also giving te- uh, 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 about 10% of this. It probably will be 10% to... It's great. It's working. But anyway, the church was probably meeting in a home. Probably the home of wealthy members. One home or probably more than one home of wealthy members because they would have had a big home a big space in which to meet. Now, what was probably happening, you can, and, and this is from experts that I read, a study, study of, obviously, and also from, from the words here, that those who were wealthy had a special place, the living room, the, 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 the nicest space where they would have reclined at a table, eating a lovely meal and getting drunk, calling it the Lord's Supper. But the rest of the church would have met in a place called the atrium, a bigger space, where they would maybe have not had food and maybe would... uh, And and this was talking of status. You have high-status people, low-status people. The high-status people have the best place, the best food, their best best welcome. And that's not uncommon, is it? And, And we can blind to it amongst ourselves, and, and maybe they were blind to it, because the culture they were in, you can be blinded by the things, you're obviously blind to the things, aren't you, around you, in your own life. Are you hospitality, hospitable to everyone? You know, how are you uh, being hospitable? How welcoming are you in your, in your life, and so on? We can, we, but that's not what we're talking about, we're talking about the Lord's Supper. So, that's the situation, There's this division between high status, low status, and 1 Corinthians in many ways is trying to make the point that everyone is high status because you're all children of God through Christ. And that's the wonderful thing. We're all, and we're all working at that. We may look different, we may have different experiences, but we are one in Christ. The same Holy Spirit lives in all of us. We're all children of God. We've all been raised up to a place of royalty. We're all privileged people. We're all, we should see each other as we are in Christ with the eyes of faith and treat each other accordingly. And that takes some work because you're selfish, I'm selfish. I can be lazy, I'm sure you can be lazy. We all like to relate to the people who we most find easier to get on with and so on. So we've got to work on it. There should be this difference between maybe people outside. The church should be exemplary in this. And the Lord's Supper, well, the way they were doing it, and the way they were doing church life was divided into these strata. And we mustn't be like that. So that's the situation they're in. And when we talk about the Lord's Supper, I'm just going to make four points. Hopefully it won't be too long. I want to make four, four points about it. So it's, the, the point is remember the love of Jesus. Just say remember the love of Jesus. Remember the love of Jesus. That's what we're doing when we take communion. We're remembering the love of of Jesus. And we're remembering it in these four ways. We look back. Say, look back. Say to your neighbor, look back. <laughs> yeah, you tell, you tell them. Look back. And then look forward. Say, look forward. Look forward. Look back. Look forward. Look in. Say, look in. 
and look around you. Oh, the, I'm not going to say it. You knew what I was going to do. You, you laughed. You, you understood. It was a song. It's a song. Anyway, look forward, look back, look in, look around you. Okay? So let's first of all talk about looking back. Let's look at um, these words here again, verse 23 to 25. I re- for what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. So we're looking back. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. On the night he was betrayed. Around Easter time, when we, well, we were celebrating at Easter anyway, we look back. When he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So you're looking back. Say, look back. So when you take bread and wine, you are looking back to that last supper. You're looking back to Jesus dying on the cross, taking his body being broken, his blood being poured out. We remember the love of Jesus by looking back. You know, we can look back and see many things. You will have regrets. You will have things you wish you had done or hadn't done. Your past can haunt you. You can make bad decisions that you wish through your life you'd never made. You can live with that regret and that weight for a long time. And as Christians, though, let me remind you, when you look back, let something else eclipse your sin. Let the blood of Jesus, let the death of Christ be your biggest vision when you look back. Amen? Let that eclipse, let that be your history. Jesus That swallows up and is the most prominent part of my past. Let that be the case. May that be the case. And it will be the case if we take bread and wine and remember these things. So remember, we read in Matthew 26, 26 to 28, we're looking back to the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, said to his disciples, take it, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is happening at the Last Supper, on the Thursday, just before he's about to die. And let's also remember that there is a chain here. We're looking back to the Last Supper, but the Last Supper is looking back to what? Passover. Yes. So Passover, and again, I'm just skirting, very briefly touching on these things, was the remembrance, so they were looking back to when God brought Israel out of Egypt, when they painted the blood of the lamb, a lamb, the blood of a lamb over their door, so that death passed by their homes, and they came out of Egypt, and then they passed through the sea, passed through the wilderness, into the promised land. They're remembering, obviously that was a con- conflated sort of thing there because it took a long time going through the wilderness didn't they but the the bit about coming out of Egypt that's what the Passover we're remembering that but Jesus takes that meal and he re he refocuses it and says I'm taking this meal 
And I want it to be for you, when you take this meal, a remembrance of my death, my blood, the way I give you freedom. So they looked back to the Passover. We look back to the Lord's Supper. And we also look back to the Passover and how that is taken into that. Because in Passover, we remember freedom. You've got freedom in Christ. You remember that they didn't have death. You will not face death in Christ. You remember how the enemy was crushed. The enemy will be crushed. There's great hope. We could talk a lot more about this. But we look back to the Passover and we bring it into the Lord's Supper as to what it means. So look back to this. He talks about this new covenant in my blood. New covenant. So they were under the Mosaic covenant. There were lots of things. A covenant, again I could do a whole talk on this, a covenant is an agreement between people. And a great one is obviously marriage. It is an agreement between you. We are committed to each other. Until death, we part. That's the covenant that you make in marriage, an unbreakable covenant. Now, we obviously know there's failures. We obviously know life can be bad, but there's, the ideal is the covenant, right? We, we, we commit ourselves to each other until death, us to part. That's the covenant. And you make the covenant by making vows to each other before God, before witnesses. That's how the covenant is made. So you've got this relationship with this new person now. Now, what's a covenant with God? The covenant with God is this. How do I have a relationship with him? Well, he tells me how I can have that relationship with him. And he gave the Mosaic law, and he gave the sacrificial system, he gave the temple, he gave lots of stuff that they were to do to keep that covenant, to be in relationship with God. In the new covenant, we remember this. The new covenant is this. You are forgiven for all your sins. You have a relationship with Jesus. How? Through faith. Say faith. Through faith. That's it. By believing Jesus died for me to take my sin away. I give my life to you, Lord. You're in the covenant. You're in this relationship. Unbreakable relationship with God. That's the covenant you're in. He's committed to you. Do you know God's committed to you? If you're a Christian, he's committed to you, absolutely. Unbreakably so. You may wobble a bit. You may wobble. He doesn't wobble. He's committed to you. Absolutely, fully, completely, utterly committed to you. So important you know this as you go through the trials of life. Look back. Look back. Remember the new covenant in my blood. I'm committed to you. I love you. As we look back. We're going to move on. I could talk a lot about this. Let me just touch briefly, though, on this subject. This can be a controversial issue, and it is a, it, it, there are different views on, on what we call communion. Does, what is, what, what is this bread and wine? So, it, it, so some Christian traditions would teach that when a priest holds up the bread and says, this is my bread, uh, body, this actually becomes, actually becomes the, the body of Christ. And this actually becomes the blood of Christ. The idea being that it's like Jesus' sacrifice is being repeated every time you take it. I would disagree with that view. Jesus died once for all to take away your sins. His, his sacrifice doesn't need to be repeated. It is finished. Say, it is finished. That's what Jesus said from the cross. It is finished. All sin is swallowed up in the cross. If you've received Jesus, your sin, past, present, and future, is dealt with. So we do not, and, and, and there's another, there, 
but our view, principle, and there are other views around that about what happens to the bread. Let me just tell you what I think the, the words of this text, I think, mean. It means this. This is bread. This is wine. And this is like a, um, an object lesson. It's a physical reminder of a spiritual reality. And that in taking it, you are remembering the body of Jesus broken. And in taking the wine, you are remembering the blood of Jesus given for you. These things are not, they are just simple elements. They can be fruit juice. They can be wine. They can be, the, the, the bread is not important. As you're going to go through here, it's what you actually believe that's important. Not what these are made of. So they're symbols of a spiritual reality rather than becoming the things themselves. Now, that may mean nothing to you, but to some people that is very important. I just want to make sure that you understand we as, what we as a church would believe. These are memorials. These are rem rem remembrances rather than actually becoming the things. So let's look back. Look back to the Last Supper. Look back to the... the Look back to the death of Christ. Look back to his body given. Look back to his blood given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Look back and remember you are forgiven and you are loved. Look, look, and then forward. Secondly, look forward. It says here, for whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So you get this other idea here. That when you take bread and wine, you're looking forward to that day when he comes again. Looking forward. He's coming again. He's coming again, guys. And what's he going to do when he comes again? He's coming to judge. He's coming to restore all things. He's coming to bring this fallen world and, and the suffering and the trials and the what you're going through, it's, look forward. It's going, you're going to be eternally with God in a new heavens and a new earth where the sun is always, I don't know if the sun's always shining, but maybe you'll be so sanctified you don't mind the rain. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be glorious. You need to think about that. You need to remember that. Whatever you're going through right now, look forward and see that coming. He's coming. He's coming again. He's coming to restore all things. It's a big subject, isn't it? But you're looking forward and you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So this morning as you take bread and wine, remember, he died for you. His body broken, his blood given for the forgiveness of your sins. You are forgiven, you are loved, but look forward and he's coming again. This world is coming to an end. He is going to restore all things. What are you living for, guys? Are we living for that or are we... we caught up with all this just small vision, okay? Set third, look in, examine yourself. Now, this is going to be challenging to some of you. It, it's challenging, right? So let me, let me read you 27 to 34. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ and eat, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if you were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. When I come, I will give you further instructions. So examine yourself before taking 
the bread and wine. It's very simple. Examine yourself. Examine your heart. Examine your thinking. Examine your relationships. Bring them before God. Ask him to search you. Is there any way he would like you to repent and change? Because you can see this, can't you? If we did examine ourselves, this is what we're talking about, healthy relationships. If we examined ourselves, we would see that my relationship with Jesus and my devotion to God maybe isn't right. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I come back to you. And it is that simple, by the way, guys. It's that simple. Forgive me. I come back to you. Maybe, as, pe- as you examine yourself as people in the church, that you are fallen out with or you're f- fallen out with p- privately. You repent of that. Decide what you're going to do about that. Are you going to say something or are you just not going to say something? But you've got to forgive them. Just decide what you're going to do and do something about it. Examine yourself. Examine your relationship with Jesus. Do you, it says here, discern the body of Christ? In other words, do you discern that Jesus died for you? When you take that bread, do you discern that he died for you? Do you believe he died for you? Do you believe that he took your sin away? Do you believe that? And if if you don't believe that, please don't take the bread and wine because it doesn't mean anything to you. Don't take it because you, others around you are taking it. Just If you don't believe, or I'm not sure if you believe, just let it pass by. It's not a problem. But do you believe that Jesus took your sin away and you are saved by putting your faith in him? So this is not about, you know, um, examine yourself and work harder. Try and be perfect. No, examine yourself and receive the grace of God. Examine yourself and receive the forgiveness of God, right? Examine yourself and forgive others. This is not about you working really hard to be perfect, because you can't be. But when you, what you can do is receive the love of God and forgive people, and then work on those relationships, right? It's probably enough about that. So look in. Examine yourself. He talks about discipline here. God disciplines. In Hebrews, it talks about God disciplines those he loves. He loves you, so he disciplines us. And those disciplines, those hardships, those trials, those difficulties of life make us think, oh Lord, they, they, they pull us up, don't they? And they're meant to remind us to come back to Jesus and come back to loving each other. So look in, so look back, look forward, look in, and finally, look around you. Look around you. Discern the body of Christ. The secondly, there's that idea that we are the body of Christ. Remember each other. Choose to love each other. The band's going to come up, we're going to worship, and then we're going to take bread and wine in a bit. Choose to love each other. Choose to believe that you are the body of Christ. It, you've been made the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 17, because there is one loaf, we who are many form one body. We're all share, as we all share the one loaf. Jesus loves you, and we need to learn to love each other as Jesus loves us. And that's like sacrifice, guys. It takes time. It takes laying yourself down for the good of others. Giving up your life, like Jesus, for the sake of others. It means, you know, this morning you're here at church, aren't you? But you chose to sacrifice your lovely lion that you maybe you, you wanted. That's just a silly little example, but to be part of a church community requires sacrifice, requires love, requires laying down our selfishness, requires, you know, prioritizing. 
But as we take the body of Christ, it's another opportunity to commit ourselves to each other. No matter what, as Jesus is committed to me, no matter what, I am choosing to commit myself to you no matter what. Many people walk out on friendships and they can walk out on churches because they feel things aren't quite as they would want. I want to say to you, friends, I am committed to you. I'm committed to be to serve you and to love you. And I trust and I know that you can say the same for each other. And if that's not you, please, I encourage you. Let's get, let's get a heart for the local church. Let's get a heart for this church or whatever church you're from. Love them because that's what the bread and wine speak of. So let's stand together. Let's remember Jesus. Let's remember his love for each other. Let's remember his love as we look back. His death. Let's look forward. Remember, he's coming. Let's look in. Am I committed to him and to his people? Let's look around us. Am I going to love the church like Jesus loves me? There's a lot there. Let's worship together.